Yeah, so our next speaker is uh, Tom Spencer. He's a professor at the University of Missouri. Um, he's a National Academy member um, who's uh, well known for his work in livestock, especially um, on the function of the uterus and placenta and the molecular pathways that uh, specify those organ systems. All right, so I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about um, some work uh, that's basically done in large animal models that's centered around uh, developmental biology and reproductive uh, sciences. All right. Well, maybe it's going to be a very short talk, <laughs> which some of you may appreciate. So I just wanted to st start out and well, this is, it's, hold on. I don't know why it's not showing the same. I need to back up. How do you do that? There we go. All right, so I just wanted to think that this is a large team of people that uh, do this work. I'm not done yet, I usually use this as my first slide, and that this has been funded by the USDA, NEFA, as well as the NIH and some uh, other places like Science Foundation Ireland and Select Sires. All right, so I think it's pretty obvious that uh, if you measure fertility, which is conception rates to a single insemination, that in some of the species that are polyovulatory, you have pretty high fertility rates, like in sheep uh, and pigs. But if you go to a monovulatory species like horse, uh, cattle, as well as humans, uh, it's pretty clear that there's an overt problem in terms of for subfertility and infertility, and that pregnancy loss is also a major limitation to production efficiency and adoption and efficiency of assisted reproductive technologies uh, that we use to treat uh, human fertility as well as uh, domestic animal infertility. So particularly today, we're going to talk about cattle. And in, if you look at pregnancy loss in cattle, the majority of pregnancies are lost during the first two months. And this is exactly what you see in terms of humans as well. Uh, and so there's a lot of developmental processes that occur, occur during early pregnancy in terms of the what I would call the first 60 days. And that includes uh, ovulation, obviously uh, fertilization in the oviduct, creation of a blastocyst that then enters the uterus and undergoes, at least in cattle, this tremendous elongation process uh, which occurs right before establishment of the placenta. So this all occurs within the first 60 days. So the determinants of pregnancy success really rely on both uh, the developmental competence of the embryo, this includes the genetics of, of paternal contributions in terms of the sperm, maternal contributions such as the oocyte, and there are some distinct epigenetic influences on this process that we really don't fully understand at this point. It also involves the reproductive tract environment, and that would be the environment of the vagina, the oviduct, and the uterus, and we're going to talk more about the uterus in terms of how it impacts uh, subfertility and infertility uh, in cattle today. But the overall impacts or the success of pregnancy is dependent on this. It is the origin of pregnancy complications, and it's well accepted uh, in humans now that the majority of later pregnancy complications, like preeclampsia, fetal growth retardation, uh, as well as other syndromes, really originate during the first uh, two months of pregnancy. And this, of course, can negatively uh, program or positively program offspring health. So I got into this area because I was working uh, with a group at the University of College Dublin, and we had shown that there's some distinct alterations in terms of the gene expression profile of the uterus during early pregnancy. So you can see uh, over here that days five and seven of pregnancy are very similar, and days 13 and 16, so you get this dramatic shift in gene expression that is really driven by uh, the effects of ovarian progesterone. And then we also showed that around day 16, the conceptus begins to influence endometrial gene expression. But the problem is that 
you know, of the 18,000 genes that are expressed in the endometrium, which are the most important, right? Which are the driver genes that are important for pregnancy establishment? And we knew that there were distinct gene expression differences and that actually the embryo, the uterus could sense differences in the embryo, whether they were derived in vivo in, or by in vitro means or nuclear transfer. And so we just basically asked the question, what are the most important genes in terms of this? And we used basically natural variation in pregnancy rates to answer this uh, question. So we essentially took a large group of animals and turned them into a human fertility clinic. And so we synchronized them. We gave them one in vitro produced embryo on day seven of high quality. And then we asked, are they pregnant on day 28 by ultrasound? Are they pregnant on day 44? And then essentially we terminated their pregnancies and did this over and over and over. And so what we are able to diverge out of this population are a population of animals that always got pregnant, a population of animals that never got pregnant, and then a population of animals that would get pregnant, but only 25 to 33% of the time. And it turns out that if you look at uh, most uh, OBGYN clinics or in the human population, uh, this is exactly what you see in terms of the human population. About 5 to 10% of females are completely infertile due to female factor infertility uh, rather than male. And this also holds true in terms of most production agriculture systems. So we asked the question, you know, what is wrong with these animals? Can we understand the genetic basis uh, for their fertility problems using this natural variation in pregnancy rates? And to kind of make a long story short, you know, we found that there were no differences uh, in their pregnancies on day 14 when you normally find uh, a small embryo within the uterus of about two to four millimeters in size. And so we did what we call the money experiment in which we slaughtered, we made all these animals pregnant and we slaughtered them on day 17. And day 17 is a very uh, interesting time point of pregnancy in cattle because the, the embryo goes from about a one or two millimeters in size and actually elongates tremendously over a period of two to three days. And it actually looks like a really thick piece of dental floss or umbilical tape if you've ever entered the obstetrics and gynecology world. And so this is very important because this is when the embryo produces signals that cause the mother to know that she's pregnant. And so this period really is very interesting, not only because of this tremendous elongation, it's also when you have a different trophoblast development uh, occurs in terms of the differentiation of binucleid cells that produce factors that are involved in maternal adaptation of pregnancy. You also have an origin of the Allen toys and yolk sac placenta, which is important for embryogenesis. So there's a lot of things that are occurring uh, during this time point. And kind of one important note, maybe this is for the breakout session tomorrow, this is actually an area that we simply don't know much about. We don't know, understand transcriptional regulation of these processes. We don't really understand anything. This remains a black box of pregnancy. And actually, I know one of these slides in the lower left is from some really nice work that Harris Loon published a couple of years ago, illustrating the dramatic uh, embryology type changes that you see during this uh, period of pregnancy establishment. And so we essentially uh, took all these, uh, a subset of these animals, uh, we gave them two in vivo produced embryos, and then we looked on day 17. And kind of surprisingly, we found that there's really no difference in the high fertile and subfertile animals. That's, there's no difference in their pregnancy rate. However, if they are classified infertile, uh, actually we found only one conceptus, and that conceptus was severely growth retarded. Uh, whereas this is what we found in all the other types of high fertile and subfertile animals. If you measure the length of the conceptus during this time period, uh, you'll note that the high fertile animals on average had about a two-fold longer conceptus length than the subfertile animals. There's a lot of variation uh, in this developmental process, and we still understand if you're in a longer embryo, do you have a better chance of survivability? Because as you know, uh, size does not always equate in terms of actual matter. 
So we did a lot of uh, transcriptional uh, profiling of both the conceptus and the endometrium from these day 17 animals. And just to remember that, you know, we know that the infertile animals did not have a conceptus on day 17. Well, we know that the subfertile animals are going to go on and lose their pregnancies uh, by day 30. And so if you look at the conceptus transcriptome, uh, we found about 1,300 genes that were differentially expressed, um, about 558 genes that are increased in the high fertile animals. Uh, many of them encoded known secreted trophoblast proteins, as well as factors involved in lipid metabolism. And you might imagine that if you're going to grow this tremendously long conceptus and you're going to establish a placenta, that lipid metabolism is very important for this process. And genes that are decreased in the subfertile animals included well known trophoblast differentiation factors, as well as those that encode secreted proteins, as well as lipid metabolism. And many of the decreased genes in the subfertile conceptuses are lethal in mice uh, when you mutate them, and these are due to defects in embryogenesis or placental development. So we went on to profile the endometrium from both the open as well as the pregnant heifers. And here is a summary of the data, and basically if you're an, a normal animal that's high fertile, you always establish pregnancy, there's a tremendous response to the endometrium to pregnancy. So you have about 4,000 genes that respond to pregnancy. If you're a subfertile animal, you'll note that there's a disruption in the response of the endometrium to pregnancy. So you have about a fourfold decrease in the number of differentially expressed genes, but most important, a lot of the genes that are down-regulated normally in pregnancy are now down-regulated in the subfertile animals. So it turns out that basically what we think is that the endometrium of these animals is responding inappropriately to the conceptus, and that's causing later pregnancy loss. And this is exactly what you see in terms of a lot of pregnancies that, if you look at the differences between an in vivo-derived pregnancy or one that's carrying a nuclear transfer-derived clone. If you go on and use a Phantom 5 database and you map, map all the known uh, either ligands or receptors present in the conceptus or the endometrium, there's ample evidence that there's disruption in a large number of critical signaling pathways in which you have uh, signaling pathways that are involved between this developing conceptus and the endometrium that are known or surmised to be important for pregnancy establishment. Now, what's interesting, if you look at only the open animals, then you find that there's almost no gene expression differences, whether they were high fertile, subfertile, or infertile. And actually, this is well known in the human literature that you can't take a biopsy of an endometrium from a, a subfertile or infertile uh, patient and determine whether or not they're going to have an enhanced ability to get pregnant. So obviously, if they're just missing their endometrium, they aren't going to get pregnant. But really, in terms of uh, translational diagnostics, just looking at the endometrium or assessing a few transcriptional regulation genes is not sufficient to basically determine whether or not uh, a woman is going to get pregnant or not in, a, in an IVF clinic. So we also uh, genotyped uh, a subset of these animals. We genotyped 30 high fertile and 55 subfertile and infertile animals. And we found several loci that were either strongly or moderately associated with fertility. Uh, what's interesting, many of these were uh, actually located on the X chromosome. And currently we're finishing up studies where we've done whole genome sequencing on all these animals. We're undergoing an analysis of copy number variation in collaboration with John Cole at the USDA ARS. We've also extended these studies to dairy cattle. So originally we did this work in beef cattle. Uh, we've extended these studies to dairy cattle where essentially uh, if we work with the right facilities, given that very large numbers of heifers are raised or females are raised in the dairy industry because they're the ones that produce milk, uh, we've also taken, uh, done fertility phenotyping by artificial insemination. We've 
uh, characterized uh, DNA from 500 high fertile or 500 subfertile animals, high fertile conceived on the first service. The subfertile animals only conceived after the fourth service or were cold uh, due to a failure to conceive. And also we found an association in terms of this genotyping array where we found about 34 SNPs representing about 26 QTLs were strongly associated with heifer fertility. So our conclusions are that cattle have an innate differences in uterine competence to support conceptive survival and development. Important biological mechanisms underlying subfertility and infertility manifest between days 14 and 17 of pregnancy. This involves altered endometrial response to the conceptus, ultimately a programmed survival of the conceptus as well as development of the placenta, and it results in early embryo loss. And of course, this is also what's been championed in terms of the origin of later pregnancy complications in humans, that if you have problems essentially during the first two or three months during the implantation and placentation phase of pregnancy, that you end up with these severe pregnancy problems that endanger health of the mother as well as baby, such as preeclampsia and fetal growth retardation or preterm labor. But the good news is that the majority of animals in our studies actually have a good uterus. That means they have the ability to get pregnant the first time or after two to three matings. So then you would postulate that there are intrinsic differences in the conceptus that underlie pregnancy loss. And so that's essentially uh, what my laboratory, as well as many others across the United States and world, are now working on is essentially working on this phase of pregnancy and trying to understand early and late embryo loss, but really the origin of pregnancy loss due to defects in either the embryo or extra embryonic structures such as the placenta. And one area that is particularly unique in terms of domestic animals is that there's a real advantage in terms of using dairy cattle for this work. So in the dairy industry worldwide, there's about 1, 000, only 1,200 active sires. Most of these sires have been genotyped or fully sequenced, and there's a council on dairy cattle breeding that actually nominates these individuals, and, and there's a consortium that pays for their sequencing. And you have a large number of sires that are mated to a, a large numbers of females. So for each sire, we can get data on either a, from between 1,000 to 100,000 matings to determine uh, how fertile they are. These records are curated by all the farms in the United States as well as a national database which is housed uh, near here in Beltsville, Maryland uh, called the USDA ARS uh, Agile Facility. And in terms of actual genotyping, there are millions of cattle that have been genotyped worldwide. Dairy and beef cattle in the U.S., there's over 3.5 million that have been genotyped with either a low or a high density array. In Ireland, actually all dairy cattle and all beef cattle have been, now been genotyped on the entire island, which is uh, kind of a phenomenal resource. So currently what people are trying to understand are what are the primary influencers of pregnancy establishment? That is, what are their genetic mechanisms such as transposable elements or mitochondria, uh, long non-coding RNA, small RNAs, as well as that we know that because we have inbreeding problems within each of these breeds, there are uh, segregating homozygous recessive embryonic lethal alleles that have actually some quite high penetrance in terms of 15 to 20 percent of the population are carriers for these. We know that there's also epigenetic influences in terms of sperm and egg quality that involve DNA and histone methylation, and we've heard a lot about that from other talks today. But essentially, this kind of black box of pregnancy is real ripe for trying to understand this early and late pregnancy loss. So current foci that our laboratory as well as others are working on are you know, you can phenotype populations of these animals essentially using collaborations with uh, producers. See, very easy to hold genome sequencing now. You can study in vivo pregnancy establishment, as well as uh, several labs have developed in vitro models of trophoblast differentiation. 
Uh, our lab is doing a lot of single cell RNA-seq right now to try to understand, you know, what are the differences uh, in the placenta as it develops between the mononuclear and binucleate and multinucleated cells. This is very similar to what you see uh, in other species such as humans and mice. And we're using a lot of sequencing technologies to try to understand different transcription factors and how they develop during this time period. I think on a more global level, what we're talking about in terms of genetic mechanisms would be there's undoubtedly some polymorphisms that are involved in this. I would not be surprised if there aren't a lot of de novo mutations that are involved in the loss of the embryo or primary extra embryonic structures such as the yolk sac or Allen toys that cause some of this pregnancy loss. We know from our own preliminary data as well as others that there is a significant influence of copper number variants and they likely are probably more important uh, than single nucleotide polymorphisms in terms of some of this pregnancy loss. We know from uh, a lot of other people's work that these homozygous receptive embryonic lethal alleles are also uh, segregating in the population. And again, I think it's this area is real ripe in terms of transposable elements and how they influence ultimately embryogenesis uh, using this approach. But I think this area is real fascinating because, I mean, you can really get at the heart of the primary embryonic and placental development that occurs in all species and use a comparative approach to really understand an important loss in terms of dairy and beef cattle as well as other domestic animals and really fill in kind of a black box of pregnancy that we don't understand in terms of domestic animals and is completely inaccessible in terms of the human. Uh, particularly during my state, there's no way that you're gonna be getting any early human embryos and so this is what's required in terms of comparative biology. So what I end with is that animal models for reproduction and development of biology research are, are very important. So in sheep has been a predominant model for maternal fetal medicine as well as neonatology and pediatrics. Pigs are a great translational biomedical research model, particularly for nutritional programming and neonatology. Horses are absolutely fascinating in which they have an invasive placenta that survives immunological rejection by the mother and still functions to create a foal at the term of pregnancy. And really cattle were the origin of many of the assisted reproductive technology procedures like in vitro fertilization, maturation, ICSI, as well as embryo transfer. And of course animals have an essential role in human health via nutrition with meat and milk. So with that, uh, I look forward to the uh, session later in terms of any questions that you might have. So thank you very much.